Thank you. Um, so we're definitely not going to do any particle physics today. Um, but today I'm going to give you, help you do, uh, take the first few steps uh, on training your first image uh, classifier using PyTorch. Um, just before we start, can I get a, uh, a hand for everyone who has used PyTorch before? Only a few, that's good, because well, we're really going to start at the beginning. Um, and so, well, basically first I'm going to tell you, first start at um, what is actually an image classifier, that's not so difficult. Um, then we'll go uh, by what's a neural network, how do we actually build one in PyTorch, and then finally, what can we do with them? And in the spirit of this morning's, uh, um, this, uh, morning's keynote, um, I'm going to show you a bit how I played around with uh, an image classifier and what cool things you can do with them. Um, okay, so first let's have a look at what is a classifier. So suppose we have um, a label training sets of points. So we have two dimensions, x1 and x2, and then we have a, a set of data points and they come in two classes, either red or green. Well, okay, that's cool. Well, in this case, we can see a pattern. So that the green ones are on the left side of the screen and the red ones are on the right side of the screen. So we could say, for example, well, um, let's draw a line somewhere around here and then say everything that's left of this line is green and everything that's right of this line, that's red. So now we have a model, a very simple model, it's just a line um, that can tell us uh, whether a point belongs to one class or the other one. Um, so then when we have an unlabeled data set, we have uh, points like these, in this case, just white points, um, then, well, what we can do is we can use this same line that we uh, had before and use that to color the, uh, all the points that we had into uh, green and red. Well, so far, um, that's a classifier, and I'm pretty sure um, that most of you have seen something like this before. Now, sometimes you want to do something that's a little bit more complicated um, than using just a simple line. And in this case, we're going to use neural networks. And neural networks, um, probably most of you have heard about, about them, um, look something like this. Um, here you see a series of dots, circles, and they represent neurons, and they come in layers. So we have the input layer on the left, a hidden layer, there might be multiple in the middle, and an output layer on the right. And they are connected by these lines. So how do these neurons actually work? Well, neuron um, looks something like this. You have a set of incoming um, signals on the left. And all of these signals are then multiplied by a weight. And these weights are the things that we use to train the neural network. They are the things that we must learn when we actually um, build one neural network. So what we do is we take those inputs, we multiply them by the weights, then sum them up, and then in the end apply some kind of activation function um, of which the main property is that it's uh, nonlinear, um, which makes uh, the neural network more capable of learning stuff. Typically what we use, and we'll see that more um, today, is we use the rectified linear unit, um, shorthand is just value function, which is uh, y equals the maximum of zero in x. So basically it's zero if x is negative and otherwise it's x. Okay, well that's fairly simple. So how do we actually use a neural network like this? What do we do with it? Well, in the case that we had before, so we had um, the 2D, all these 2D uh, points, we had um, two dimensions, x1 and x2, and then we had these points that we wanted to classify in red or green. Um, well, we could use the neural network like this. We can say, well, we have two input nodes, and one of them is x1 and the other one is x2. And then um, we use, we propagate these signals through the network with these weights and these um, functions. And then um, we think we can say, uh, well, we have two output nodes, and then one of the output nodes is the probability that um, the point belongs to the green class and the other one uh, that it belongs to the red class. So now, of course, if you first make a neural network like this, um, it's not going to do what you want because you have to set these weights to the correct values. So what do you do is you take um, all those points that you have labeled before, um, you pass them through the network, see whether it makes an error, and then um, tune the weights in such a way that um, it will actually perform better. So you have to do a lot of tuning before you um, uh, get a neural network that actually does what you want. But um, right, 
we are talking here about image classification and not about 2D points. Um, so what we want to do is instead of just having two inputs, we want to say when we have an image, well, in this case, the left one here is a dog and the right one is a cat. That's something that we can easily see, but we would want a neural network to recognize something like that for us. Um, and for that, you cannot use a simple neural network like the one I showed before, um, but we're going to need something um, a little bit more complicated. We're going to need something that is called a deep convolutional network. Well, that's quite a mouthful, but well, in the end, it's not so extremely complicated. Let's start with the deep part. A deep neural network is just a neural network that has more than one hidden layer. Preferably, ah, in this case, I think 10 or so, um, could be 20 or 30, um, but just more than a few. That's all that is there to deep neural networks. And then the convolutional part. Well, we need um, convolutions in order to interpret those images. So on the left side here, we see that our, the input to a neural network like this is uh, an image. And what we do with these um, convolutions is we take a box and we say we aggregate all those pixels from uh, that area of the image and then apply some function over it. We could say we could um, try to see whether there's a big difference from the light right to the left or the top and the bottom or the, whether all the pixels have approximately the same value. It's just some function that we use, uh, apply using those weights of a neuron. And then what we do is we shift this box around across this image such that we get a matrix of the results of all this, uh, this function across all the image. And in this case, um, you see we don't just use one convolution, um, but we get, in the end, four feature maps. So we could use four convolutions. Of course, you could use many more. Um, then, typically what you do after using a convolution is you subsample. So you say, well, for all, uh, each out of uh, two by two results, we take the maximum result, which is called max pooling, or we could take the average result or something like that. That's just, um, we do that in order to reduce the size of our neural network, because otherwise it might become too big, and if we have too many weights to tune, it becomes too difficult to train. <laughs> Typically, after that, we do more convolutions, so you have more future maps. In this case, we do 10 more convolutions, then more subsampling, and in the end, we make a fully connected layer, and a fully connected layer is just one, um, just like the one I showed you in the simple neural network before. And then in the end, we have an output um, in this case, two outputs. So we could, one of them could represent the probability of the image being a robot and the other one of being a cat, something like that. Okay, well, um, a, a typical example of a convolutional neural network is uh, VGG16. VGG16 is a big neural network um, and it consists of 16 layers um, and has in total 144 million weights. And what it does, um, you'll, I hope you recognize some of the, um, the, the ingredients here. Um, we start with an image, and this image uh, is 224 by 224 pixels, and then three layers, one for each color, red, green, and blue. And then, uh, so what we do is we start at the left with uh, two convolutions, then some max pooling to subsample, two more convolutions, more subsampling, and then more convolutions, subsampling, more convolutions, and then in the end, um, we end up with uh, the blue uh, areas. These are the fully connected layers um, that we have in the end. So a standard neural network at the end, but then big with like 4,000 nodes. And in the end, we have one layer with 1,000 output nodes. So why 1,000? Well, in this case, um, this is because this network was made um, to, tr to be trained on ImageNet. An ImageNet is a collection of 14 million images that was annotated into a thousand classes, of which, for example, cat and dog. And so this, this network was trained um, by, well, um, with using a lot of computers um, to get like 90% uh, accuracy on these 1,000 classes. So, um, well, um, cool, this thing already exists, but aren't we going to train our own? Um, image classifier? Well, of course we are going to do that. And um, to do that, we use transfer learning. So remember, we had this network, and this has already been trained. This has 144 million weights, 
um, that have all reasonable values such that it can cl accurately classify all those kinds of images. Now we're going to make use of that by taking off this last part of 1,000 classes, just removing that whole last layer and putting our own layer at the end. Not necessarily a simple layer like that, but just a new classifier that we put on top. So we remove the end and we add our own layer. So this has the advantage that all the weights in the um, previous layers, they already have some reasonable values. This network already knows how to recognize sharp edges, round edges, um, strange patterns, all those kind of things, all the things that you typically see in a photo, it already knows how to deal with those. And then in the end, it comes up with a set of features and we build a classifier on top of that. Isn't that cheating? Of course it's cheating, but hey, you never get anywhere in life without a little bit of cheating. So what we want to do is we're going to make use of what people have done before and uh, build our own classifier that doesn't classify stuff that they have trained it on. Because, well, if you want to classify images into exactly those thousand classes of ImageNet, well, of course, you can use the pre-trained version of VGG. Um, if you don't, well, this is the way to go. You just remove uh, the last layer, and, well, then you're all set. Um, so now you know how exactly how to uh, train your own image classifier, right? Well, let's have a look at the code. But before that, um, you might ask me the question, why did he choose PyTorch and not Keras? Because you may have heard of Keras as well. Well, Keras is also a library that allows you to do neural networks. Um, but you could say Keras is there first, or PyTorch is more flexible. You could say Keras is faster, which might sound very important. Um, but the main thing that I think is important is that PyTorch lets you play with the internals. Um, basically, that means that if you get to tweak the neural networks and not just import them and use them, um, that you learn more from PyTorch. So that was the main reason that I chose for using, um, using PyTorch. Um, well, OK. Now, um, let's have a look at it. And here it gets a little bit uh, technical. So bear with me. Um, first. If we want to um, use PyTorch, we want to use a neural network, we have to define the neural network. And you do that by um, well, creating a class. In this case, we could, uh, create a class uh, that's called net. And uh, this inherits from the uh, neural network.module from Torch. Um, and when we initialize this class, we first initialize um, the superclass, the module, um, not so interesting. And then we define the four layers of our class. So first, uh, there's the convolutional layer, which is a 2D convolutional layer with some parameters. Um, we'll go over those in a minute. Then a pool layer, which is 2D max pooling. So this is a subsampling where we take from a, uh, in this case, a kernel size two. Uh, so a two by two matrix, we take the maximum value uh, in order to reduce the size of our neural network a bit. And then we have two fully connected layers, like the normal layers um, um, that uh, come uh, after each other at the end, and then the second um, fully connected layer ends with 10 nodes, so we have 10 output nodes. Secondly, we have to define the forward method, and the forward method, um, it accepts a single argument that is called x, that is um, the input, and the input comes in batches, and in this key case, these are 32 by 32 pixel images in three channels. Now, if we then apply this convolutional layer, um, that's the, first, the second thing we do. We apply the convolutional layer to X, um, and that converts it to 18 channels. So we get 18 different types of convolutions, um, and again, 32 by 32 pixels. Then we apply, apply this ReLU, ReLU function um, just to make it nonlinear. That helps our neural network with learning more complicated stuff. Okay. Then we apply the pooling, which reduces the picture size um, from 32 by 32 to 16 by 16 pixels. And then, um, since we are done with the 2D stuff, we have to reshape the whole vector to a single um, very long vector of size more than 4,000. Then we are ready to apply first the first fully connected layer, again the nonlinear function, and then uh, lastly uh, the last fully connected layer, after which our output has a size 10. OK, but hold on. We weren't going to train our own neural network, right? We were going to do transfer learning. Yes, that's right. So um, 
what we first have to do, if we're going to do transfer learning, well, we have to import this pre-trained network. So what we can do, and in this case, I've chosen um, SqueezeNet, um, and I, I did that because, well, VGG is actually a little bit bigger than SqueezeNet, takes longer to uh, run. So well, I'd go for the easy option. Um, so let's have a look at SqueezeNet. So SqueezeNet, you can simply import it and then instantiate it, say pre-trained is true, and it will download the weights for you, um, which is a big set of weights, takes a while, but then you get a pre-trained network, and you're gonna, it's ready to use, all ready to use um, for you. But we weren't going to use the, um, the pre-trained network with 1,000 classes, so we're going to modify it. Let's have a look at the internals before we modify it. So if we have a look at the internals, um, we see if we just print the network, it will show us all the layers, and we find that it consists of two parts. First, it's called, the first part is called the features, and it has a lot of layers, and I couldn't fit them all on the slides. I think it's 20 layers or so. Um, and then you have lots of convolutions and pooling and these ReLU functions um, all in a sequence after each other. And then in the end, there's the classifier part, which um, consists of four pieces, of which you already recognize three. There's the um, 2D convolution, there's the ReLU, and then average pooling at the end. Uh, the first part is dropout. And dropout is a um, technique to help your neural network learn a little quicker by, while you're uh, training it, um, dropping the inputs or the outputs of uh, half, in this case, with a probability of 50%, so half of the neurons. Um, that makes uh, it impossible for the network to rely on a single neuron or a, a, a small subset of neurons. So it must uh, make more connections to uh, learn the same information, um, which basically makes it more robust. Um, so what happens here in the classifier is we, we apply this dropout during training. Then we have this uh, 2D convolution from uh, 512 to 1,000. And this is, again, where you see the 1,000 classes of output um, in the end. And then there's the value and the average pooling. Um, so in the end, we have, uh, again, 1,000 outputs, um, one for each of the classes that it um, wants to be able to classify. Now, if we are going to change this and make it our own classifier for our own classes, well, then all we need to do is, well, simply define the number of classes that we have for example, four, well, download the model, set it up. Um, first, it has a parameter that um, says the num classes, so we can update that to four, although internally it's, it's not even used, but let's do it um, to be complete. And then what we can do is we can take this classifier part. Remember that it's um, the, with the um, 2D convolution layer was the one with index one, and we can simply replace it with a new 2D convolution layer. Um, that goes from 512, just like the original, but now to our number of classes, not 1,000. So that's all you need, and now you have a new neural network that you can train um, in order to classify your classes. Okay, now let's have a look at how you train a model like this. That looks like this. Um, so we start with setting our model to the training mode. That's important. I'll get to, uh, to why in a little bit. Then we need to define our criterion. How do we score whether uh, the model is good or bad? In this case, we use cross-entropy loss. And we need to define an optimizer. And the optimizer, in this case, is stochastic gradient descent. Um, we say, OK, these are the model parameters. And then there are some um, arguments that we'll have a bit look at uh, in the, at a later stage. And then um, we loop through stuff that comes out of a loader object, and again, we'll look at uh, the loader object later. And these are the inputs, so the images, and the labels, so the classes that you've labeled them to be. And for each of those sets of images and labels, because we do this in batches, you always um, process multiple images at the same time. For each of those sets, we first reset the optimizer, uh, because we don't want to use any information from the last batch. Then we simply pass the images through our neural network, and then we get some outputs. We calculate how good the outputs are. Do the outputs correspond with um, the labels that we give it? Then we propagate these, uh, this loss backward through the network. So we calculate for each neuron how well did it do 
on scoring your, uh, your training images. And then in the end, when we know that, um, we can optimize the weights. And then every time we loop through all our training images, we call this one epoch. And you're going to do this quite a few times when you want a classifier that works a little bit well. OK, and once you've done that, say, suppose you've, uh, you've trained 20 epochs, then of course you want to know how well does my uh, model actually work. Well, for that, first we set the model to evaluation mode. So what is this difference between the training and evaluation mode now? Well, um, most importantly, it disables the dropout. Of course, if you're going to train, then it might work well to uh, let your model use only half of the information in some, some of the stages. But when you're evaluating, when you're trying to actually classify an image, you want to make sure that you use all possible information that you have and disable dropout. So that's the most important reason why we always must call these eval and these train methods. Well, then we can say with no grad, which prevents um, the PyTorch to do internal, calculation that's, uh, internal calculations that you don't need. And then again, we loop through this loader. We pass the inputs through the model to get the outputs. We can get, um, for, so the outputs, these are vectors with the probability for each class. And we can get the maximum of these, which is then the class that it um, will classify um, the image as being. So we can get the predictions from that. And we can sum the loss in order to get some idea of how well our model is performing. So I promised you also to have a look, a closer look at the loader. So where does our data actually come from? Well, what you need to do first is specify where are your images on disk. And you do that um, by defining those image folders. And you want to have a separate train and test set. And so you, um, you define two image folders, one with a path to the train, uh, path through the train images and one with a path through the test images. But to both of those, you need to first also define a transform. So what methods will be applied to the, the um, images when they are loaded? And we define two different transforms, one for the training images and one for the test images. Let's first have a look at the test images. So what we do is we say we com compose a transform, so it, compo uh, it consists of multiple steps. First, we resize it to size uh, 256. Then we crop out the center, the two, two, uh, 224 pixels in the center, and then we transform it to a tensor such so that uh, PyTorch can work with it. Well, that's fairly simple, but for the training images, we do a, something that's a little bit different. What we do is we take a randomly resized crop of the same size um, from the image. So we don't always look at the same part of the image, but it could be a little bit more zoomed in or a little bit more zoomed out or a little bit more to the ref left or the right. This means that every time that we train an epoch, our model actually gets to see a different set of images. Well, the, the source images were the same, but the actual image it looks at is just a little bit shifted or zoomed. So it gets to learn not from the individual pixels, but from actually the information that's in the image. That's really important. Now, once we've defined those train and test sets, we can define the train and test loaders, which are uh, simply a, a data loader where we uh, provide the data set that we want to use. We set the batch size. That's the number of images that we process at the same time. The number of workers is the number of processes that can um, process these images while loading them. And we say we want to shuffle them. That means that every time we train an epoch or we evaluate, we do this in a random order. Um, for training, this is really important. For testing, it isn't. OK, so we're almost there. But I skipped something that's fairly important. Remember that when we defined our optimizer, which is stochastic gradient descent, um, I said, well, there are, these, there are these arguments at the end. Um, and the most important one is the first one. The LR is the learning rate. And this is the rate at which we ch change the weights when we're training. Um, so we need to figure out what is actually a good value. Now suppose that we have only a single weight and we only, I can only uh, plot, um, make a plot in a single dimension. So suppose we have a, a single weight and we want to optimize this. Um, we want to find the place right there at the bottom um, of this graph. Now suppose that we start all the way at the right of this graph and we want to, by taking little steps, 
find the bottom of the graph. Then, of course, we want to make sure that we don't take, for example, steps that are too large. If we make steps that are too large, yeah, you could step all the way across the, um, the valley to the opposite side. And then if you're unlucky, you might even um, go so far away that you, uh, in the end, step out of the valley and even well, reduce the performance of your model. On the other hand, if your learning rate is too small, then first of all, it takes a very long time to get there. But in this case, you'll find this local optimum there and you won't find the global optimum. So balancing this learning rate is really important. So how do we actually find the best learning rate for our problem? Well, the best th thing that you can do is just try them out. Um, basically, well, here we define a function, we set the learning rate for the optimizer to a certain value, and then for a certain range of values, um, so this log space from some minimum learning rate to some maximum learning rate with a number of steps, and for each of these learning rates, we, well, we set the optimizer to this learning rate, and then we train for a number of batches, and then uh, after that, we evaluate for a number of batches. So what you'll then find is that, of course, during the course of the, doing this, your model is going to first, you're starting with a very um, low learning rate, is going to improve very, very slowly, and after a while, this improvement is going to be quicker and quicker and quicker until your learning rate is so big that it will go all the way away from your um, local or global minimum where you're at, and the performance will degrade enormously. So what this will look like if you do this um, is something like this. And you know, so typically what you see is that first you have some, um, some value of loss, and as you uh, increase the learning rate, your loss will go down until after at some point it will go up way all the way until your model doesn't do anything anymore. So what we found here is that typically something, well, like 10 to the minus 3 is the optimal learning rate. So that's what we set it to. But of course, um, the optimal value also depends on the state of your model. If your model doesn't do anything yet, well, then probably a very high learning rate is good. Well, if it's almost there and you just want to squeeze out that last percent of accuracy, then probably a very low learning rate is the right um, way to go. So that, um, for that, um, we have the learning rate scheduler. Um, we can use, for example, the reduced learning rate on plateau, which is a scheduler that um, whenever the um, performance of your model during training is, has reached a sort of plateau, is stable, it reduces the learning rate and then tries again. So after every epoch, we then have to call scheduler.step with the loss that we found. And um, based on that, it might reduce the learning rate. That looks like something like this. So if you, while you're training, um, your accuracy goes up at the beginning, and then after a while, it figures out, okay, maybe we're stable now. Um, let's reduce the learning rate, and you'll see that it takes these steps um, after all the time until, well, at, at some point, you decide that the accuracy is good enough. Okay, we're all set. Um, let's have a look at actually um, some data that I've played with. So of course, if you want to train a model, you need data. So what I did is I took one of these, a Raspberry Pi, and I set it to work for a couple of months. And uh, I gathered a data set um, of photos taken in the world's largest cities. I took 72 cities, half a million images, uh, of 10,000 photographers, all in all, some 30 gigabytes of data, and I made sure that all of these are licensed for, for reuse, such that I can show, you, show them to you right now. So of course, the first thing that you do when you gather a data set is you have a look at the images themselves. So first, I live in Amsterdam, so what I did is I had a, I had a look at all, the, or a, a subset of the images that were taken in Amsterdam. So this is a nice one. Um, typically, we don't have weather like this um, so often, um, but well, it's nice, right? Something very typical also that you'll find in Amsterdam are bikes. This is a very typical scene from Amsterdam. For those of you who have been there, um, I'm sure you'll recognize it. Okay, well, this looks good, right? Let's have a look at another one. So this is a really nice view. But hold on, this wasn't taken in Amsterdam. We don't have any cliffs like two, within 200 kilometers from Amsterdam, probably even more. So what's going on? Let's have a look at the metadata. Well, there's this tag that says Amsterdam. So probably 
Someone thought that it was taken in Amsterdam. Well, it wasn't. On the other hand, it also has a tag that says Dublin. Interesting, interesting. There are quite a few tags, actually, on this image. And I couldn't fit more than this. This is less than 5% of the tags um, of this image. And I certainly don't see a teddy bear museum on this image, or all kinds of these things. So it turns out people don't always tag their images um, as they should be. So I had a look at where all the images that were supposedly taken in Amsterdam were taken in the world. Well, around here. And actually, the, the bench that we were just looking at was taken right there at the edge in Korea, some nice island in Korea. Well, definitely not Amsterdam. So what you can do then, um, well, what you could do, of course, we only want the images from Amsterdam that were taken right there, the red dot in the middle. That's where Amsterdam actually is. Um, what you can do is you can take all the images, take um, the median latitude and longitude, and now the mathematicians will cringe because, of course, these are circular values and you can't take a latitude, a median of the latitude or a longitude. Well, in the end, you can just do it and it works. Um, then what you can do is you can remove all the images that were more than five kilometers away and you repeat this for all cities. Then we have a clean data set, right? Okay, let's do it. Okay, then after that, I had a look at all the other tags and thought of something cool that we could do. These were the most common tags in this data set. Well, of course, if you're going to look for um, photos taken in cities, then the most common tag is city. Well, but I think uh, other than city, maybe um, this one, skyline here, is the most interesting one. Let's try to make an image classifier that recognizes skylines of cities. So what I did is I took the 10 most common cities in my data set. Um, th those were these. Um, I, here are the image counts. I split these into a train and a test set, like this. And then um, we train a model. Hold on. We wait. First, we wait. Um, and the waiting actually is quite annoying because, well, training a, um, a model like this um, takes a while. Um, in this case, I took a fast GPU. Um, I used my boss's credit card. He doesn't know yet. Um, he'll be a little bit surprised. Um, and then I spent like 20 hours or so on training time. And then I had a model. So then, well, you feed in an image. And who knows where this image was taken? This is London. And they got it correct. OK, well, that's nice. So this one, where is this? This is Sydney. And it learned that. All right. Wow, that's cool. This one. Anyone? This is Toronto. I heard it right there. OK, cool. This one is tough. Where is this? This is LA. And actually, the model got it all right. So I was pretty impressed. So this is clearly Chicago, right? And then here, we have Philadelphia. Got it all right. Again, this is Tokyo. Cool. Even this one, it's not really in, um, so complicated. Uh, it doesn't have too many buildings, I would say. I wouldn't know it, but it got it all right. It's Houston. Oh, then here, we have Shanghai. And this is clearly Chicago, right? <laughs> Wait, what? What just happened? Well, it turns out there was one photographer who labeled all his um, photos with the tag Chicago. Well, all he did was take photos of sandals on pavement. <laughs> and my model, well, he it got it all right. It learned that a sandal on pavement is, must be in Chicago. And of course, well, then when you feed this test image to the model. It gets it all right. This must be Chicago. OK, so we need to fix this. Um, let's come up with a plan. OK, first, what we can do instead of uh, splitting the images randomly in train test set, what we can do is we can split them by photographer. In this case, at least, the, all those uh, sandals will end up either in the train or in the test set. So then we wait. Takes a while. This is really annoying. Um, once in a while, because, uh, well, uh, at, it's late at night, you want to do some hacking on your project, and then you think of a solution, you fix it, you start training, and then, well, you must wait till tomorrow to see the results. 
Anyway, um, the results of this one were terrible because, of course, well, if you put all the sandals in the train set, then it will get a very high train accuracy, but the test set accuracy will be uh, terrible. Um, in fact, it will just be overtrained on those. Um, in the end, we just have too many mistagged photos. So I needed to come up with another plan. Um, and in this case, um, what I did is I built another model. And in this case, so what I did, I took uh, a model that um, classified only two classes, and I said, either it has a skyline or it is not a photo of a skyline. And I trained on all data that I have, so half a million images, and I gave them the labels, um, either it is a skyline when it has the skyline tag, or it's not a skyline when it doesn't have the skyline tag. Then I could make predictions for all data and make, and then only use the, the data um, that were labeled with a positive prediction for skyline for my original model. Again, then we have to wait, takes a while, um, gets really annoying after a while. Um, but then in the end, the results of this were pretty nice. Um, out of those with a, a tag that had skyline, I had about 6,000 that were labeled by the model as actually having a skyline, and about uh, 1,000 that were labeled as not having a skyline. So I could just get rid of those. Um, but on the other hand, I got 1,000 images that did have a skyline, according to my model, um, but that um, didn't have the skyline tag. So still, I ended up with about the same um, number of images. So I recreated this train test split, then had to wait again. Um, as I tell you, this gets really annoying, and my boss will not be happy with me. Um, and in the end, um, I got yet more results. And so in, as you can see, in the end, the accuracy was about, um, well, 70%. Um, after 200 airport, uh, uh, training epochs or so, so that's, uh, I think, 24 hours of training, um, I think this was uh, fairly reasonable. Okay, well, that's cool. Um, let's have a look at uh, some of the actual results. Um, so this was, uh, it got it right, Chicago, of course, that's something I would also recognize. So that's cool. But it means it actually um, learns to recognize some of these cities. Um, also, Los Angeles, it got it right. In this case, it, uh, the model said um, New York City, while in reality, the label was Philadelphia. Um, but to be honest, looking at this picture, I probably would have gotten it wrong as well. So sometimes it's not that bad. Here we have an example where um, the model says it's London, probably because of the bad weather, um, but it was actually taken um, in Toronto. Sometimes, um, though, you cannot explain the errors that the model makes, um, because in this case, well, although the skyline is a bit difficult to see, um, but you can see some high buildings in the, end, uh, at the, in the background, um, but you can clearly see that, um, well, this street definitely is not uh, an American street, but it's something like in Asia. Um, so in, this was actually taken in Shanghai, and it got it wrong. Um, yeah, so, that was it, um, but it, before I uh, end, um, just some funny, final remarks. Um, training your own image classifier really isn't that difficult. All you need to do is cheat a little and do transfer learning, otherwise you won't be waiting for 24 hours for, for months on end. Um, doing PyTorch is fun. Um, Keras might, might be easier and faster, but PyTorch is a lot of fun. And in the end, having clean data is way more important than having a good model. Thank you. Um, in, uh, after this, if you want to have a look at my code, um, you can have a look at this GitLab link. You'll find an example, um, or all the code that I used to uh, create this image classifier. Um, and keep an eye on our blog, blog.godatadriven.com, where I will make a sort of transcript of this uh, talk. Thanks. There are questions. We have the two mics, so please line up. Hi. Um, you mentioned two very different kinds of hardware, the Raspberry Pi and the GPU. Can you say a little bit more about whether this is really practical on a Raspberry Pi alone, and if it's not, then how does one actually take the next step to use the GPU as well? 
Uh, yes, of course. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I did not train any of the, these models on the Raspberry Pi. I, I merely used it to collect my data. Um, since that's just a bunch of web scraping, um, you don't need any um, um, like big hardware for that. Um, if you're going to train a model, well, I, I tried training it on my, uh, my MacBook. That takes way too long. Um, I did have to get a machine with a GPU. Um, on the other hand, if you have a very small training data set, you might give it a try on your laptop. It's still fun. You might get as far as 10 or 20 epochs and then get a reasonable accuracy. Um, it still is fun to play with. If you want a little bit better, um, getting a GPU or, I don't know, getting a cloud machine with a GPU um, is always the way to go. In the uh, one miss uh, categorization where you had the Shanghai, like very small uh, section of Skyline, why include that in the test set? Um, so I didn't actually um, actually make the choice myself to include this in the test set. Um, I included all images that uh, were classified by the previous model as being a Skyline. And so apparently it got to recognize the properties of what is a Skyline and it recognized in the background this this is something that looks a bit like a skyline. Well, I guess my question is, you mentioned that clean data is better than having a good model. And so this to me doesn't look like clean data. I mean, it might be like, I'd expect a, a super genius classifier to figure it out, but I would have excluded this if I just saw your talk and didn't see this example. So I'm curious if I'm just wrong and there's some value in stuff like this, or? Well, in this case, um, I guess it's just laziness. Um, I didn't go through my uh, entire test set before using it. Um, because while going through thousands of images and manually labeling them as good or bad um, is not my idea of fun. I think a proper data scientist must be lazy. Any more questions? Well, again, thanks. <laughs>